as you can hear, I'm, I'm actually from Germany, so forgive me and you have to live up with my, with my accent. It's, it's great, it's really great to be here. It's, it's, it's very special. It's good for me to be back in a, in a college. I, I think it's exciting. And when I thought what I could say, I really went back and thought, what, what changed me in college or what changed me uh, and, and, and made me to, to what I am today. So, so I want to share some personal experience with you. But I also want to say that I'm really encouraged to find a college here and we had just a tour uh, with Bill Jones and, and Joseph and I talked to your president and David and, and, and to see a college this is situated here but wants to be globally engaged. A college which makes it very clear we are wanting to confront our students with new ideas, new research, new scientific methods, but that is not enough. We also need to engage and confront our students with new relationships, with new people which you have never met in the place where you were grown, born and where you grew up, and also to take our students into some uncomfortable places and to interact and live with these people and share their life. And I think this is so important today. If we are not learning to live in diversity, if we are not learning in college to live with differences, we will not be able to change this world and we will not be able to live together in a peaceful world in the 21st century. So I think what you are doing, I can only commend your college and all of you to attend the college, which offers you this challenge and opportunity. And sometimes it's not comfortable. And I will tell you some stories of my own experience where this is not comfortable, but in the end, it will make you a better person and it will make you into the person God wants you to be as a leader in this church, as a college graduate that makes a difference for your own life for the life of your family, but also the community, and in whatever job you will have afterwards. So, I wanted to share three, just three experiences where I personally experienced diversity and differences in a way which has changed me and which brought me into the work I'm doing now. As I told you, I'm, I'm German. Uh, I was born and raised in Germany. And I come from a very small town. My father uh, was a Methodist minister. I was a Methodist minister's kid, which is not easy in a small town. Uh, probably, I don't know whether your pastor has children, but you can ask them. They will probably agree with me. Uh, that, that was my upbringing. I didn't know many people who were different in color or language or anything, because in Germany in the 50s and 60s, that was not something we were used to. My first really big encounter with somebody different was actually just across the border. It was in Germany. But in those years, there was East and West Germany. So in 1975, when I had just finished high school, I was invited to be part of a group of young people who went to East Germany, to Rostock, which is a, a harbor uh, town in the north of East Germany. And in that place, every year there was a big international trade fair. And for the communist government in East Germany to show that they were also internationally open, they allowed the church to have a youth event from many different denominations and from other Eastern European countries. One of the very rare opportunities for young Christians from Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria to be together with other Christians. When I arrived on the first day, I was so stupid I saw a huge building which has these nice banners. They had forever friendship between the Soviet Union and East Germany, or, you know, full of banners. They used, to, they like to have these banners. I took a picture. Five minutes later, I was taken in by the secret police as a Stasi because I had taken a picture of the headquarters, which I had no idea. So that was an interesting start of my first experience in a different place, although it was Germany. What however marked me and impacted me most were, was to meet these young Christians. These Christians, my age, 18, 19, lived in East Germany and tried to live their faith, but in a very different environment. They were not allowed to go out and have any public event. They were not allowed to uh, publish books or spread any leaflets or anything outside the four walls of the church. Everything was restricted to inside the church. 
And if they had very good high school exams and A-levels on everything, they would still not be able to go to university if they had done a confirmation class in their church. Because if you had done a confirmation class, you were not allowed to go to university. That was reserved for non-Christians, for people who were party members, and people who were seen as more favored by the state. So this was an experience where I thought, how can you be a Christian when you are not able to speak about it publicly? How are you a Christian when you can just do it in your little circles at home and in the church? But 15 years later, 40 years later, in 1989, the wall came down between East and West Germany. Something nobody believed. There was a wall all through Germany, and you could not cross it. It was very difficult. You had to have a special visa. You were very much examined. I lost so many books because I tried to smuggle some books in, and they found them, and they would not let us to take them. So it was a very difficult border, but it came down. And people were expecting, and there was an interview, which I think is, 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 is really, really impressive, with one of the governors there of the East German side. And in the interview, he said, we were expecting, we were expecting a violent revolution. We were expecting some outside attack, but we were not prepared for candles and prayers. We were not prepared for candles and prayers. It was really a peaceful revolution. Because these young people in 75 I met were praying at home, were organizing at home and in the churches and started to build this movement which brought down the world, the wall, in a non-violent way. We were not ready for prayers and candles. A very important experience for me. They were Christians in a very different way, but they taught me this lesson. A year later, in 1976, I was lucky. I was a youth delegate to the Methodist World Methodist Conference in Ireland, in Dublin. And I shared a room with a delegate from South Africa, Derek Hodson. Derek was the youth director of the Methodist Church in Southern Africa, and his colleague, his black colleague, was not allowed to travel because it was a time of apartheid. You might have heard about it. Apartheid was a very strict system of oppression of the black people in South Africa. Black people had no rights, black people had no place in society, and everything was confined to the minority white rule in that country. The Methodist Church was on the side of change, but very often people would not get visa because they didn't want them to connect with other Christians. What impressed me with Derek was when at night he kneeled in front of his bed and he prayed. He prayed very fervently. He had a prayer life which I did not have. I was really admiring his prayer life. And in the morning when we walked to the conference center, he stopped at the kiosk. There was no internet. <laughs> you couldn't uh, see any news or Facebook posts or anything. But he stopped at the kiosk there and bought every newspaper he could get to try to find out what was happening to his colleagues, his brothers and sisters in the church in South Africa. Because this was June 1976, there were riots in Soweto and other parts of the country where the young people, the young black people stood up and said, it's enough, we want education, we want education as the white chick kids have, and we want it now. And many of them got killed. And many were Christians. Many of them were brothers and sisters and youth group members of Derek. So every morning he was looking at this, and at night he was praying for change and for the suffering in his country. This bringing it together, engaging in social justice, standing up for the rights of the black people there, but also having a fervent prayer life rooted in the gospel, that was something which was new to me, coming from a very middle class, quiet little Methodist church in Germany. And the last example I want to give where meeting other Christians, being open for differences and diversity, helps us to change and grow. I worked for many years in Brazil, David just mentioned it, as a missionary. And part of my work, apart from teaching in a Methodist seminary, was working with homeless people in the center of Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is the largest city in Brazil, one of the largest in the world with about 20 million people. And we had a, I, I worked with Catholic sisters 
who had worked among the homeless in the city center. And one activity was a soup kitchen. Only that the soup kitchen was very different from any other soup kitchen you probably know. Because it was not the volunteers bringing soup to distribute among the people, but it was after the street market, all of us, people living in the street, volunteers coming together and trying to negotiate something from the vendors which was left over at the market. So we may have got a fish head because the fillet was sold, but we could negotiate the fish head for a fish soup. Or we got some vegetables which we were not able to sell, which were a little bit rotten already, or not looking nice, and we got them. And we brought this together, cleaned it, and cooked the soup together on an open fire under the bridge. Even the firewood came from the boxes which were used to carry the vegetables or whatever to the market. So what was different is everybody contributed to this soup. It was not one people bringing something and the other receiving, but they were all part of it. And it was sometimes uncomfortable. We were eating out of these tin cans. Uh, I mean, you, you ate what you produced there. It, it was a stretch for me at the beginning to eat together, but it created opportunities of being together as a community which we would never have if they had kept this distance between those who serve and those who receive. And one day, one of the women who lived in the streets in Iran, maybe 40 years old, she came to me because after the meal we always had a worship time together. We always did it after the meal because God's grace is free. You don't have to wait for a meal uh, and, and be forced to hear the gospel. So we wanted to give them a good meal first, and then whoever wanted to stay, stayed on to also share in a gospel reading and in a worship. And in one of the worships, the Nira came and gave me a little plastic rose. It was really a, a, a plastic rose, uh, and, and I still have it on my desk in, in my office. And she gave me the plastic rose and she said, Thomas, I found this rose in the trash, and I want to give it to you. As long as you can find a rose in the trash, there's hope. As long as you can find a rose in the trash, there is hope. She taught me what hope is. Somebody living in the street, sharing an experience of hope with me, what she had found in the trash. So, to be ready to listen to people who are different from us, to go into situations which are uncomfortable, to be confronted with ideas which shape what we have learned and how we were brought up with, that is what it means to be globally engaged. That is, I think, and I hope, President, I don't say anything wrong here, I think that's what you want to do here at LaGrange College. And we at Global Ministries, we would love to partner with you, to be in this together with you. Global Ministries is the mission and development arm of the United Methodist Church. We have missionaries from around the world, about 350, and you will meet some of the younger uh, adult missionaries, global mission fellows during these days. You will meet mission missionary from Nepal, Kesley, who is still on the flight. We also have the United Methodist Committee on Relief that works in disaster response in Nepal after an earthquake that responds to the Haiti earthquake or to tornadoes and storms in the United States. And all this work is becoming more and more global. As David said, we have 200 years of mission history. In 1890, uh, the mission was founded in New York, 200, almost 200 years ago. And most of these 200 years, it was people from the north going to the mission fields going to the south. Missionaries being sent by the United States or Europe going to Africa and other parts of the world. This is changing. Global engagement is changing. So you have people from the Philippines going as missionaries to Japan or to uh, Taiwan to work with Philippine migrants and seafarers <coughs> in those countries. We have a missionary from Cameroon to work and give solidarity to the Africans trying to enter Europe and are getting stuck in Tunisia at the border between Europe, uh, between Africa and Europe and be together and build community. 
We have missionaries from Brazil serving with Hispanic Latino communities in Geneva, in Switzerland. So mission today, we say, is from everywhere to everywhere. Our staff now comes from over 30 different countries. Our cabinet, our leadership team has members from five different continents. This is a changing, changing landscape of mission. And what is also important, as in the examples I shared with you, the people who had been the recipients of mission have become the agents of mission. The mission has changed to come from the margins to the center. And you see a renewal of the church in Europe through the migrants. Migration has become a blessing for the church because these people in many places in the world have given new life and new energy and renewed the presence of the church. In Italy, the Methodist church was almost dying. It's a growing church now because of migrants who have joined the church. And just last week, there was a big meeting between the Pope and the Valdensian and Methodist Church, which are a united church, where they share in their joint effort to be an open society for people who seek refuge and who seek a place of safety in these countries. And not at least to tell us the story of Jesus again and to help us to change and become missionary again. So, to finish up, and you will have many opportunities to meet our staff in your classroom, in other events tonight at First UMC. I want to say that this partnership is really about being connected globally, helping each other to discover that our call is more than one to ourselves, but it's always a call into a community, into service, into something which extends our own life and our own reality. And at Global Ministries, we try to do this as we keep our spiritual roots and our social engagement in a balance. As a Christian organization and as a Christian college, these always belong together, spiritually grounded and then also practicing social holiness. And we have lay and clergy. Don't think that you are only called if you become a pastor or a minister or a priest. We are all called and we all have a vocation. This works much better in German because Beruf, which is profession, and Berufung, which is vocation, is basically the same word. There are only three letters difference. So make very sure that what will be your profession is also your vocation and is a calling which is more than just earning money. And lastly, I want to stress that at Global Ministries we try also to keep justice and mercy together. We want to stand up for justice, like the young people in Africa in June 1976 for a change of a system which did not give them room. But at the same time, we have to practice mercy and be with those people who are at the margins and help them in their day-to-day -day survival. So justice and mercy, as the Bible says, have to work together. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm looking forward to it. Two exciting days here with you. And feel free to talk to all of us at any time. And I hope this is just the beginning of an exciting relationship between Lagrange College and the General Board of Global Looking forward to some great things. Thank you. The face of mission is changing. And um, so that's a, a statement um, in opposition to the ways we have, that, that mission have been known around the world, right? So um, as a young person, I, my family is from Liberia, West Africa, and so I grew up uh, seeing missionaries um, in my context. And often missionaries were foreigners who came from elsewhere and came to uh, Liberia to work. And so um, two years ago, I, was, I had graduated from a graduate school. I went to seminary, um, post-college, and I was looking for ways to sort of connect my faith uh, to my vocation or to the work that I was ultimately being called to do. And so I found out about the Young Adult Mission Program 
and uh, someone who was very excited had learned about, uh, you know, theory and wanted to put that in practice in terms of how faith calls us to do work of justice. Um, I got sent to local missions, so actually I was thinking originally because of my understanding of mission as going elsewhere to those people doing work for them, um, I wanted to do something international. And so the program actually, um, when I was interviewing for the Young Adult Mission program, I was told actually, you know what, your gifts actually match with the need of a community right here in the United States. So I ended up becoming a domestic missionary where I was from Massachusetts and I ended up serving in Washington State. And going there, being very excited and wanting to do things, um, I learned that often in mission, we, we go with an agenda, we want to help people, and often God is calling us to just be present and to listen and to stay silent for some time and to understand the issues within a community. So as Thomas kept talking about the idea of mission changing, it's also these ideals, um, the words about solidarity and about work of presence and accompaniment and to know that this is the work um, collectively that we can be a part of, that we can take our gifts whatever it is that we've been trained to do, whatever it is that, that brings us alive, that we can bring that work to mission. Um, ultimately, I got to, my work there was as a social justice advocate. So as someone who had a, um, a sort of bicultural background, um, my family being from West Africa, um, hearing David talk about the world being very much uh, more small and connected, the globe ended up being right in my backyard. I was working with refugees and immigrants from all around the world who were uh, struggling with issues of acculturation, wanting to know how to hold on to their ideals and, and their values, and also realizing that their young, that their children were becoming American. Uh, speaking to the immigration problem out in the Pacific Northwest, um, there was a detention center there, and um, you know, a cop will stop you for a broken taillight, and then will um, get your information, find out you're undocumented, and then hold you in a jail cell for immigration and customs enforcement to do that. So I was doing a lot of work um, talking to the churches about how our faith calls us to radical hospitality, and so how then are we going to speak to the issue of immigration and to educate our community about it? So had I not been um, practicing the work of presence, hearing what it is that the community needed and how they needed faith communities to walk alongside them, I would not have been able to um, share their story and for it to be incorporated, incorporated into my own. And so I, wanted to, so I wanted to introduce two of our US2 domestic missionaries as well. So we have um, Andrew Kastner, who also serves as a US2 missionary, right? So that we have young adults who also serve in the country, and then we have some who go international. And Caitlin Kastner as well, who serves in Florida. If you wanted to share a few words about um, the, the missionary program. Yeah, um, how are we doing on time, okay? Okay, so I'll keep it brief. Um, but I just wanna say, I mean, you know, there's a lot of hurt in the world. I think we all know that, especially when I was finishing up college, I saw all the issues that were going on, and I felt like I want to be doing more than just going and getting a job, getting a paycheck. Um, there's so much opportunity out there. Um, and this, this is what this program is all about, to just give you a little brief background. So I'm from Kansas City. Uh, I have a degree in sports medicine and nursing, um, and I have become very passionate about public health. Um, and so uh, my wife and I, we uh, met doing some uh, work um, around the world, and we have actually been placed in Miami, Florida, of all places. Um, which, if you've been there, is, is uh, very, as the Miami had. If you've been there, um, it's very uh, culturally diverse, um, and it's been an amazing experience. I am working with uh, the homeless population, and um, just like in the same vein as what Secretary Kemper said, um, I'm just really trying to do a lot of work to empower the homeless. So it's not the church serving the homeless, but it's empowering each other and coming together um, in community and in fellowship. Um, I'll let Kayla just say something. Um, and I am working also with immigrants, uh, like John did, uh, with immigrants who are facing legal problems. And we have a team of lawyers who um, provide legal assistance for immigrants for free. Um, of course, that's a huge issue in Miami. So we're going to be here uh, until Friday evening. So please find us if you are at all interested in these opportunities. And we're going to be talking in a couple of classrooms as well. So with your commitment to servant leadership, um, I think it would be a wonderful opportunity for you to come and talk to us and explore how what you're called to do um, can be explored through the mission.